How valid is this formula right over here? Well, in today's lab, we're going to see if it's true or not. First off, let's talk about this gizmo over here. It's known as an at wood machine. It's a device that's used to slow down the rate of motion so that we can better determine the characteristics of the motion of a system. There's actually two parts of this lab. The first thing you got to do is that you need to make sure that the mass of the system remains constant. And you're going to do that by simply relocating the masses. So you're going to observe the rate of acceleration in the setup that you see right over here initially. Then you're going to add more mass by redistributing the mass of the system and measuring the rate of acceleration again. Then you're going to bring another mass over and make it heavier and heavier, heavier. So while keeping the total mass of the system constant, how does the net force affect the corresponding acceleration? Does it increase linearly? Does it increase quadratically? Does it increase as a square root? Well, I guess we'll discover that after we've collected all the data. The next part of the lab is taking a look at the relationship between acceleration and mass while keeping the net force constant. What you're going to do is that you're going to fix the value of the hanging mass. Just leave it alone. Then you're going to gradually add more and more and more mass onto the cart and observe its rate of acceleration. Now you may naturally know that the heavier the object is, the slower it's going to accelerate, but what kind of correlation is it? Is it going to be a negative linear correlation? Is it going to be an inverse correlation? Or is it going to be an inverse square correlation? That too we'll figure out after we've collected all our data. But you might be asking, how do we collect the data? Well, we use this gizmo over here called a ticker timer. Its entire purpose in life is just to make dots. Now, since it's connected to the mains here in North America, it's actually going to make 60 dots in a given second. So that's the resonant frequency of this device. It's rather annoying sounding when it's turned on. What this means is that the time it takes between successive dots is going to be a fractional value. It's going to be the reciprocal of F or 1 60th of a second. Armed with that knowledge, now let's just do a sample uh, lab setup. Let's say that you have the ticker timer connected to a hanging mass, and that's it. There's nothing on the table itself. Let's observe the rate of, accel of acceleration of the falling mass. Let's say we collected this data over here. One thing I always remind students is that the first dot that the machine makes just starts the timer. It has no meaning at all. And that's why I call this the zeroth dot. It isn't until the next dot that's been placed that you know that a 60th of a second has gone by. So for every successive dot that's made there afterwards, it represents another fraction of a second. So even though you may count out 16 dots in total in the setup over here, we want to remove one because that's the zeroth dot. So in this setup over here, the last visible dot is the 15th dot of a 60th of a second. That quickly tells us how much time has gone by. Since every dot represents a 60th of a second, then 15 of a 60th of a second is 15 60ths of a second. In this case over here, that works out to 0 0.25 seconds. Now we have the time for the experiment. Next, we got to figure out the distance that the object has moved. That's not too bad. Just pull out a ruler and carefully measure it out. Let's say that in this case over here, between the zeroth dot and the last visible dot is 25, oh sorry, 30.7 centimeters. Well, now let's, let's figure out the rate of acceleration. One thing to keep in mind is that whenever you use a ticker timer, you want to ensure that you turn on the timer first before you let go of the tape. That way you ensure that the system starts off with a velocity of, that's right, zero, because that's the last piece of the secret sauce. As you may know in kinematics, as long as you have three givens, you can solve for everything else. So with time, displacement, and initial velocity, we can solve for acceleration by using this kinematic equation. It may seem daunting, as you see that there's a squared over here, but don't worry, it's actually not that bad. To find out the rate of acceleration, since VI is equal to zero meters per second, this term disappears. This cleans up the problem quite significantly, because now all we're left with is this. And it's not too bad to isolate for A now. You bring the half over, so that becomes 2, and you divide by delta T squared to solve for your A. So 
with your delta D of 0.307 meters and your time of 0.25 seconds, you can sub it in and determine that an object that's just falling off the ledge of the table will accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared. Pretty neat, isn't it? Okay, so just to clarify how we're going to use this device. Once again, in the first part of the lab, part one, we're going to keep the total mass of the system the same. All we're going to do is we're going to gradually bring the mass over every time we do the experiment again. So in your first setup, you have a one kilogram hanging mass and the total mass of what's on the table is one plus one plus one, which is three kilograms. Total mass is four kilograms. We let the system accelerate and then we measure the rate of acceleration with our givens. How long of a ticker tape did we use? And how much time has gone by for all the dots? Your VI again is equal to zero. Not a big deal. Then we rinse and repeat. As you can see in the next picture, all I effectively did was take that mass, hang it, so now we have two kilograms hanging, two kilograms on the table. Rinse and repeat. Find out the rate of acceleration. Yes, it should be lower. Or higher, sorry, because it's hanging. We then take that last hanging mass and we place it over the edge of the table. Once again, we're ensuring that the total mass of the system remains the same. We're just simply relocating the masses, but we're actually increasing our net force. How does that affect the acceleration? Part two of the lab, we're going to have a fixed hanging mass. I like to use one kilogram because anything greater than that, the system accelerates way too quickly. All right, so this is going to be our first reference acceleration. Once again, you're going to collect the distance of the ticker tape and how much time has gone by. As long as you know that your VI is equal to zero, those givens can be used to find out your corresponding acceleration. We then make the mass of the cart heavier by placing more mass on top of it. We make it two kilograms now, such that the total mass of the system is three kilograms. Yes, the rate of acceleration should drop. And if we place another mass on top, it should drop even more. And the question is, what kind of data does it produce? Does it decrease gradually in a linear correlation? Is it a curve because it's inverse? Or does it curve significantly because it's inverse squared or inverse cubed or even inverse quadratic? Okay. Um, now, if you're doing this in the classroom, you won't be using these masses over here because even one kilogram is too fast. You're going to have these carts flying off the table. So you're going to be using much smaller masses. However, if you're doing this experiment virtually, then you can use whatever app you want. I prefer using this one over here from uh, physicsclassroom.com. All right. Uh, there is one little problem here, and it's that in the simulator over here, they don't really tell you what the masses are. Here it is. All right. So if you so happen to click on the first cart, you just have one kilogram on the table. If you click on the cart beside, then the mass of the cart and the weight is two kilograms. And then in the third one you click, uh, as the pattern dictates, it's going to be three kilograms in total. As for the hanging mass, they just make it look visually larger. But what is happening in fact is that you're starting off with a one kilogram mass. Then when you click on the two or the middle one, you get two kilograms hanging. And when you click on the one on the right, you have three kilograms hanging. Let's start this again. You'll drag the cart to the beginning. You'll turn on the sticker timer. Then you'll press start and you'll see that it's gathered all the data for you. All right. So you can see that the ticker tape has a length of 1.99 meters and the time that it took was 0.9 seconds. So it's already counted out all the dots for you and figured out the time. All right. As for the tension, don't worry too much about it. You can use it as a reference, a mental reference, but that's it. Then you're going to reset the experiment or how about this case over here? You're going to start off with three kilograms. One thing I ask of you is to move this around randomly. I want the answers to be random because if you just click on this, it's always going to give the same result. All right. So I want you to simulate a more realistic lab so that when you conduct the lab, the results should be different. One thing I don't want to see any student have is to have a displacement greater than two meters. And that's because that's the factory default setting. And I don't want that. Okay. So just drag it to a point where when you do the experiment, your displacement is less than two meters. That keeps all of our data relatively randomized and relatively unique. And with a large group of students, I shouldn't see 
two sets that are uniquely the same. Everyone should have unique results. Okay. So now you have your measurable displacement, your measurable time. Again, you're starting the experiment from zero. So you could solve and figure out the acceleration in all of these setups over here. One thing that is true that you might've noticed is that the first case of the first lab is exactly the same as the setup of the last one. Even though you can reuse the data, I want to ensure that you're doing uh, this lab genuinely by yourself. So I do expect these two values to be slightly different as you are randomizing it. All right. But don't worry, the outcome of the lab should be the same no matter where you started off at, because you should still have the same relative value of acceleration. Plus minus a small error, and that has to do with the number of significant figures shown in the setup over here. All right. It's somewhere between two to three sig figs that it gives. So to expect to have, you know, uh, a 10 to one percent, well, one to 10 percent error in the data that you've collected. Beyond this, you're going to follow the instructions here. All right. So you're going to conduct the first set of data, figure out the rate of acceleration using the magical formula based upon the distance and the ticker time. Yes, you will also compare it again on the right hand side. One thing to point out is that you'll notice I write down the word units up here. And no, I do not want you to write down the word units on your final lab report. I'm placing it in white because I want you to tell me what the units are. For example, if you're looking at mass, the total units are in kilograms. That way, when you fill out this table over here, you can see the data is nice and clean. All right, you should never have units in your table. This is just way too messy looking. Get rid of that. Your data should look nice and clean like so. And the same should be true for the rest of your chart. So take a look at the unit or the measure and then write down the corresponding unit that's relative to that measure. Okay. Um, so once again, do the first three experiments and that's all part of part A. You're going to be plotting a graph that's a relationship between net force and acceleration. Remember that when the title's listed this way, what's listed first is always going to go on the Y axis and what is listed next is going to be on the X or horizontal axis. Now in science, we don't use Y or X. We don't use horizontal vertical. Instead, we always list this as the dependent versus the independent. Okay. And then you should be plotting out everything in accordance with that. But if it helps, think about the first one as your Y value versus your X value. You're going to rinse and repeat the lab. And this time around, keep the hanging mass the same, and instead add more mass on top of the cart. And then you're going to look at the relationship between acceleration versus total mass, look at the wonky graph that it creates. And then you're going to try to clean up the graph by doing an acceleration versus the reciprocal of the total mass. And then you should be able to see a nice, clean, clear correlation where you can measure the slope off of it. Hint, hint. All right. And to the last two questions over here, and then you're good to go with regards to the lab itself. Best of luck.